the last month we've been talking about what is our identity? What makes us Buffett Student Ministries? And what's, what does that all mean? We we'll talked a little bit about that. This month we're going to be talking about love. And I'm not talking about like the love that you have for your boyfriend or girlfriend or you know, random person named Brandon that you met at a camping trip. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about um, the type of love that we get from God. True love. What does that actually look like? So in order for us to have this conversation, we need to talk about what love is. And we're going to define love uh, tonight. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up. We're going to be all over the place. All over the place. So if you take notes, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I am not good with uh, giving you a printout with all this stuff on it. But uh, we have a couple of scriptures we're going to get. Big one right now. Go ahead and turn to 1 John 4. We'll be in several verses in that chapter, 1 John 4. But before we do, let's talk about a little bit about what the world says love is. So just if you will look at Siri, Siri says that love is a noun. When it's used as a noun, it is intense feelings of deep affection. It's also great interest and pleasure in something. So we kind of hear that. I have a... Uh, the love of soccer. I enjoy watching soccer all the time. So I have a love for the game of soccer. Uh, I find great interest in it, and I enjoy watching it. Um, it's also a verb. Um, when it's used as a verb, as an action word, those of you who pay attention in your grammar class, it's an action word, and this is to feel deep affection for someone or something. It's also to like or enjoy something very much. I put the old English on here because it was a funny word. Lufu, or Lufu, however you want to pronounce that. Um, but the, the interesting part about this word is, is that the word we use for love shares a root, and you know how words are made up of root, suffix, prefix, and all that good stuff. The root is from all different parts of the world, and it shares the same meaning. It has German, which is Northern Europe. <coughs> it has Sanskrit, which is India. And it has Latin, which is Italy. So if you think about the major parts of the world, you've got Rome and Italy, you've got all of the Hindu faith and everything out in India in Sanskrit, and then you have the, uh, the old monarchies in Germany and, and Northern Europe. All of them have a single word that, that shares this idea of desire and pleasure. So when people think of the word love, when those languages use the word that we commonly refer to as love, they're thinking of something that meets your desires or is pleasurable. That sounds similar to the way that we use it today, right? This is where you nod your head or you shake your head. Either one's fine. Yes. All right. So according to the English-speaking world and our culture that we live in, we can use the same word to describe our deep affection for our spouse as well as how much we enjoy nachos. <laughs> now, I enjoy nachos a lot. It's like one of my favorite like just go-to snacks. It's a comfort food to me. Um, but I do not love nachos in the same way that I love my spouse. Like, you would think I was weird if I did, right? Yep. <laughs> Thank you, spouse. <laughs> um, the point is, there's something deeply wrong with that. There's something wrong with the fact that when we use the term love, we use it so, and I use the word flippantly, randomly, at a whim, however you want to, we use that word for so many different things. How many of you have ever said, I love chocolate, or I love you know, hamburgers, or pizza, or coffee, or like macaroni and cheese, or ice cream, or like any of those things? Is that what love actually is? No, that's not what it is. In fact, if we're truly to love the way that Christ wants us to love, we've got to learn how God defines love before we will ever be able to love others the way that Christ instructs us to. You and I have a starred and a, uh, a flawed view of love due to the fall. Okay? That's not anything that you or I did. It's something that happened to the human race um, through Adam and Eve. But because of that, our perception of what love is, the way we show it, the reasons we show it, are all self-centered and flawed. We need to recapture or define what that definition of love 
actually is based on what God says. So, what does the Bible say about love? This is where we get to jump into 1 John. So, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me, with me to 1 John chapter 4. Um, 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to read a couple verses together. Uh, the verses we're going to jump into together right now, I'll have them up on the board as well. Uh, they will inevitably be smaller on the screen because... Um, first John chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 7. So, would anybody like to read that? Out loud? In front of people? Go ahead, no. Just read verses uh, 7, 8, and then read verse 11. Okay. Dear friends, let us love one another, and love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And we keep this thought going forward. John is talking to Christians here. He's talking to people who know, who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who have committed their lives to him. And he's talking to those people. So now uh, he continues this thought forward. And we'll go to verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. He in God. We have come to know and we believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected within us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. But for the one who, has, who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment that we have from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. Um, what I want to get at tonight is, is if we're going to understand what love is, the way that God intends for us to experience love and for us to show love to other people, we have to get the, the crux of what love actually is. So we have to look at love and the one who defines love. God is the definer of love. That means God's definition of love is the truth. We can come up with our own definitions of it, but God's, love, God's definition is the first one. And so we're going to walk through this. I have a philosophy undergrad. That's what my bachelor's degree is in. So I think of things in logical order. That's the way my mind works. I can't help it. Look at verse 19. I'll read it again. We love because he first loved us. So logically, God loved us first. Therefore, we are able to love others. If you flip this around, I put the because in the up era. If you read the sentence the other direction, we are able to love others because God loved us first. That's how therefore and because are flipped back and forth. You can understand. It's a sequence of events. God loved us first. We now can love other people. So, if God is the one who loved us first, who is the one who gets to define what love actually is? Do you and I get to the one who received it? No. In fact, that'd be really crazy. If I were to buy you a gift or make you a gift, like I were to spend time, make you a gift, you've never seen this gift before, you have no idea what this is, and I hand it to you, and I say, this is an expression of my love for you. Like, if I don't explain what it is, what its significance is, and what its purpose is, you don't get to experience the love that I'm trying to show to you, right? Like, it's like getting somebody a gift who doesn't really like receiving gifts. Or telling somebody good job who really doesn't experience love by verbally someone speaking to them, they experience it more when you spend time with them. Or somebody who's a, a person who, who experiences love with physical touch, like, Handshake, a high five, a hug, but you refuse to do that, you only tell them the job and that you love them verbal. Like, are they going to experience love? No, they're not. What's happening here is God is the one who gave love first. That's what scripture tells us. Therefore, God is the one who defines what that love actually is. The one giving the gift tells us what the significance is, and it tells us the meaning of it. If God is the definer of love, what then is his definition? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? 
how has God shown his love so that we can understand what that love actually is? This is the, this is the part where you get to give a Sunday school answer. How did God show his love? Jesus. Yes, he did. God is not only the definer of love, he's also the definition of love. If you look at this passage, John, 1 John actually says God is love, like there's no gray area there, right? When you think of love, God is the one that you have to think of. So if God is the definition of love, we only know what God is, what love is, by how God has made it manifest to us and how he's demonstrated it. There's two passages that we commonly quote, but when we put them together, it takes a real big picture of who God is to us. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a demonstration of his love. I chose the word demonstrate on purpose. It's the way that God showed us love. So if he's the one loving us first, and he showed us his love through Christ, we need to keep that in mind when we think of love. By this, the love of God was made manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. First uh, John 4, 9. Again, God showed his love to us, made it manifest to us, in sending his only son to save us from our sins so that we could spend eternity with him. God showed us what love was by sacrificing his son so that you and I could be free from the power, the penalty, and the very presence of sin in our lives. Like, there is freedom in Christ, and it's from those things. We don't have to give in to the power of sin anymore. And if we're not giving into the power of sin, we're not experiencing the earthly penalties for our sin, but we also ultimately don't pay the eternal penalty for our sin because Christ paid that for us. And then in the future, when we are free from this world of sin and we spend eternity with Christ, there will be the <laughs> presence of sin there. He saves us from all three of those things. So if God is the definition of love, the best way to phrase this is that that's the gospel. If you want to see what God's definition of love is, it is the gospel. All human beings earned the penalty for death because of their rebellion towards God. If you read Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is any of us exempt from that? How many of you are not sinners? Okay, no one's ready to fly. I love that. Um, and the wages of sin is death. What's a wage? Is that something I freely give you? Jackson did like this. Yes. Money, money, money. It's what you have earned. So if you all people sin and our sin earns us death, we're in trouble. <laughs> God knew that our sin would prevent us from having communion with him that we once enjoyed in the garden. I did not put this uh, scripture verse on the screen, but I do want to read it to you. <clears throat> this is God talking to um, really, we're not sure who all the audience is. Um, some people say that this is the, uh, the early part of the Trinity, where God is saying, let us make man, that whole dynamic. But some would even say that this is a his, his heavenly angels. He's making this statement to them. And he says, uh, verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has come like one of us, he knows good and evil. Now, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and he would eat and live forever. Therefore, God sent him out from the garden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. At the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed a cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. God knew our sin was going to separate us from him, and we would no longer be able to have that close-knit community with God that we once enjoyed. Y'all remember earlier in chapter 3 of Genesis where it talks about when man and woman actually sin, Adam and Eve sin? It, it, how does it describe God? What was God doing when he came upon their sin? <clears throat> Walking in the garden in the cool of the day where he normally did with them. He was, as much as God could be looking for someone, he was in the garden Expecting his companions to be with him. Instead, they had sinned. They had broken that fellowship. And he had to, he had to let them 
leave the cars. We had to drive them away from being able to spend eternity as sinful human beings. And so God knew that our sin was going to prevent that. But he didn't leave us there. <clears throat> because of the exceeding sinfulness of mankind, we would never, ever be able to get the Father, except through the one true sacrifice, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, uh, 3 and 4, you want to write that down? Hebrews 10, 3 and 4, uh, verses 19 and 20, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These are Christ's words. The only way we get back to God, the only way we have communion with God, is through Jesus Christ. Finally, because of all of these, these things, because everyone is a sinner, because our sins deserve death, because, uh, because of our sins, we can't have communion with God anymore. And because the only way we can get back to God is through Jesus Christ. Therefore, Christ laid down his life so that you and I could be right with God through faith in the finished work of Christ. John 3, 16 and 17. You, you know, For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's 16 and 17. Romans 6, 23, we talk about the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There's a but in there, and it's a gift. You deserve death, but oh, wait, there's a gift. You don't get death, you get grace. Ephesians 2, by faith, by grace you have been saved through faith, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 goes on to talk about, for we were created for good works, which God predetermined for us to perform. Because of Christ laying down his life so that you and I could be right with him, we now get to have community with God. But what does that mean for you and I now? What does that mean for our definition of love? How do we get to define love now? If we look at love and say that God is love, and then we define love based on how he has shown that love to us, there's some, I think those are adjectives, maybe, or phrases. I was really bad at English, so. Um, God is, love is selfless. It's sacrificial. It's looking out for the needs of others. It's compassionate. It's complete. It's unlimited. It's unending. It's overwhelming. It's mind-blowing. It's unfathomable. God loves us so much that you and I will work dying for it. That's love. Jesus Christ said, greater love has no one than this for him to lay down his life for his friends. Christ goes on to say to the disciples after he is resurrected, he says, I no longer call you like disciples. You are now my friends. You are now become joint heirs in the promise that God made. Like, that's love. We must learn how God defines love before we're able to love the way that Christ instructs us to. And the only way we can do that is if we've experienced that love from Christ, if we've submitted ourselves to him and experienced that love. 